Why did you run for this role specifically? So I, prior to being elected a state treasurer, I served uh, in the unicameral as a state senator uh, representing uh, Legislative District 49, which is Gretna and, and Western Sarpy County. Uh, the, the office of state treasurer is one of the only offices uh, in state government on the executive branch side, which has term limits. Hmm. Uh, and uh, we have two four-year terms and our, uh, my predecessor, Don Stenberg, had, had fulfilled his term in office and was and was leaving and mm -hmm. uh, in conversations with a lot of people including uh, treasurer Stenberg um, the, uh, it, it seemed like the the office needed somebody who had small business experience mm -hmm. I had uh, um, operated my family's small business mm -hmm. uh, in, in Omaha for a number of years but also somebody who could work with the legislature to enact meaningful legislation to uh, improve the efficiency of the office uh, and, and really make our functioning uh, all the better. So it was a it was a perfect fit, mm. and I uh, uh, took the plunge and and was ultimately elected. Would you like to tell us what excites you most about this role? Sure. So th there's nothing more exciting than traveling across the state of Nebraska uh, and talking, going into schools and talking with kids about the college savings program and the hope that actually exists for the future. Mm. Uh, and it's something that we go from from Omaha to Scotts Bluff and we're, we're we I try and get in as many communities in the state of Nebraska mm -hmm. as I possibly can mm -hmm. uh, traveling uh, the state just informing people of the benefits that come from investing uh, in in kids college uh, college education and you know there, there's a lot of uh, misperceptions about Nebraska's college savings program it doesn't have to be the the dollars that are invested don't have to be spent in Nebraska they don't have to be spent at four year uh, uh, universities, uh, any community college, trade schools, vocational schools, any anything like that, uh, can, uh, $529 Nest can be used for. So it's very flexible, it's a very attractive uh, option. So spreading the word and, and letting people know that it's not just about a little bit of money here or there, and, it, and it's not about getting necessarily all of college paid for. It's about putting kids on the path and the trajectory to go to college and forming the mindset that, that the opportunity really is possible for, for any Nebraska kid to, uh, to get that level of education. And for some uh, kids, there are a lot of great jobs out there that don't require a four-year university degree, but almost all of the jobs that are available require some education past high school. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why 529s are, are really an attractive option because it provides that flexibility for any post-secondary expense, uh, just about every, any post-secondary expense that's out there. When did you first think about serving in public office? Mm -hmm. And you may have answered this already, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna give you that one more. I was, from as young as I could remember, I was sitting in my school's library uh, and there was a cartoon book, kids book of the presidents that gave a little run down just like a little uh, poem for every president of the United States and I would go down to the library after school every day and I would read that book just over and over again yeah. uh, and I, I particularly um, identified with John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a person who as, especially as a as a when I was a kid uh, who I um, really admired mm -hmm. um, and so f from the I, I can't explain where it came from my my parents are apolitical my grandparents hmm. uh, they voted but that was about it um, and so there that's not really <laughs> in the in the family but uh, but it's something that I cared about and was interested in and I was out engaging in political campaigns at the age of 10 and 12 I was out putting up yard signs for, for candidates it's just something that I always did I can't that's explain amazing. it mm -hmm. did you have a teacher or another mentor who may have inspired that interest um, I, I think the answer to that is yes. I'd, I had great teachers uh, at my elementary school uh, who fostered that, and they could really see because there aren't that many eight, ten-year-old kids who go down to the library and read books on the presidents not, not <laughs> on their lot. off time. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but that was fostered, and it, at that point, there wasn't. I didn't have a cogent political philosophy like I didn't have a sort of an ideological route um, it was more just a desire to make the world a better place and that was it was as simple as that um, and so that that was the the forum that I had 
chosen from a very young age. And, and, and yes, my grandparents were tremendous mentors. Um, uh, they had really sort of introduced me to a lot of, of people who could help me just sort of teach me the ropes having not come from a family that was involved in politics. Um, so yes, I had a lot of great mentors. That's very good to hear. Um, was there someone, well, mm -hmm. my next question just mm -hmm. got answered, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to let you know what it is. Is there someone who mentored you and mm -hmm. encouraged you, and I think you identified your grandparents. My grandparents. Is there anyone else? I would, so uh, before I ran for office, I was a legislative aide for a state senator. Uh, and when I was a legislative aide, I was in my 20s. I was fresh out of college. Um, and I was all worked out. I was I was the the stereotypical young person, fire and brimstone, who just you know just the, wanted to change the world immediately. And I worked for a man named John Nelson, uh, who was a state senator from Omaha, uh, who would go on to briefly serve as lieutenant governor of the state. Um, and he had he and I shared a political philosophy, but his mentality he was very. He, he very much mentored me on the idea that just because somebody does not agree with you on political policy questions does not make them a bad person. And it is very easy to build strong relationships with people who don't agree with you. And it is, in fact, highly probable that you will learn far more by talking with someone who doesn't agree with you and understanding where they're coming from as long as the conversation starts with the idea that we're both intellectually honest people who are looking to improve outcomes for the state. Uh, John really sort of changed my mentality away from a us versus them conversation uh, to a how do we figure out how to craft policy that moves the state forward uh, without abandoning your core convictions and, and beliefs. And he really molded that uh, that part of my uh, political understanding when I was in my 20s. And I would, if I could add one more thing. Absolutely. Something that he taught me that I think was absolutely invalu invaluable that um, I have used and when I became a state senator, I used it every single day and I still use it today when even observing the news, is that I always sought to be able to make the argument that the, per uh, uh, to make the argument with the person I was disagreeing with better than they could. I needed to understand where they were coming mm. from so well that I could make mm. the argument of their position better than they could. Uh, and that's tough to do. It really wow. requires you to um, reassess yes. uh, uh, all of you, reevaluate and, and dig down deep as to where you mm. stand. But I, two things happen. If, if I could understand the other side of the argument and could make the argument for the other side better than they could, uh, it also very much sort of dissolves the us versus them. You, you can, once you understand someone, it's difficult. It's certainly impossible, to, I think, to hate them uh, and to view them as enemies. It's more you're, you're trying to move the state. You're trying to accomplish comparable goals. You just need to understand and have a conversation. And there are good reasons why people disagree and both sides of the conversation really need to be heard. Do you have any specific guidance to share with young people who are interested in civic involvement? You've already told us mm -hmm. how you kind of grew your own interest as a child. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would add to that? I would say anyone who wants to be, if, if anyone who wants to be involved civically, if you want to, um, be persuasive that I would go back to what I just said the best thing you can do is fundamentally understand the position of a person with whom you disagree mm -hmm. it is easy to sit around a table with a group of people who all agree with each other mm -hmm. and get into an echo chamber, echo chamber. Uh, and it, it doesn't solve anything it's not going to solve a single problem it will continue to make uh, the nation more divided, it'll make a community more divided, and it's not going to solve a darn thing. Um, that's just how our government works. It's meant to be slow. It's not meant that one side just rolls the other on a consistent basis. That's not how our government was formed. Uh, so in order to, to change the community, one has to change minds. Uh, and the best way to do that is to really genuinely listen. 
um, and understand, especially if you're talking with someone with whom you disagree, um, there is, they know something and have an experience um, that is worth learning about. And I tell you what, one thing about coming out of the restaurant industry that really helped me uh, in the political world is that you scratch beneath the surface of anyone. And I don't care how successful they are. I, I don't care what their background is. You scratch beneath the surface and there is something unique uh, and interesting about every single person that you are going to meet. And there's something to, to learn from from them and that's that would probably be the, the guidance it's step one understanding and listening and that that will take you so far mm -hmm. and if somebody trusts you and understands that you're listening to them the probability that you're going to be able to successfully persuade them goes through the roof mm -hmm. I mean they, that that level of trust is really uh, very important what do you what advice do you have for students to be involved in their schools and communities as civic leaders mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a, it's a great way, I think, of framing the question because it is the, where we can have the most immediate and obvious uh, outcomes that, are, that, that show improvement is at the local level. If you're within your school, uh, within your local community, that is, that's, it, it is the most rewarding, it's the most obvious that, um, that what you're doing is making a difference. Um, I, I think, especially at a time like this, there are so many people out there, especially something I've been talking about a lot lately has been the statistics on mental health and especially um, with the new Gen Z generation. It's um, the, the statistics are, are, are troubling compared to uh, millennials and understand there is almost certainly somebody that you know that is suffering inside that isn't letting it show and having conversations with people um, can change the course of a person's life if they genuinely feel like their needs are being heard and um, you change one person's life and you change the whole world. I mean, that's, that's really what it, what it boils down to. And, and so to start, start locally and then grow from there, uh, I think it, it makes a lot of sense and it has the most immediate and obvious impact as well. Mm -hmm.